Good morning, everybody. We're going to ask you, if you will, let's stand and begin to sing together. My name is Christy Lindholm, and I'm the worship minister here. We are excited to have you guys here at Woodbine today. Um, we have a lot of stuff going on, as always. And so right now, rather than listen to me, I will ask you to turn your attention to the screen for today's announcements. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's 9 o'clock. It's time for service. doesn't look like anybody's here right now. So I'm just going to go ahead and go in and see what's going on. Aha! Let me call you back. I knew it. You fool, do you even know what day it is? Sunday? Well, yeah, no, it's, it's the 21st. It's the first day of our Outrageous series. Oh, right. Um, what does that mean? That means our service starts at 9.57. You're 57 minutes early, you ninny. Gotcha. Um, were you hiding in there? Listen, don't worry about this. Don't worry about this. I set these up. The first day I started announcing this, because I knew, I knew, 
that people were going to forget. I knew people weren't going to remember. I knew people weren't going to put it down on their, their pagers. They weren't going to write it on their wall calendars. They weren't going to put it in their, um, their uh, cell phone. No, no, not, no. It's, it's th you call it, you get, to, you get text and call people on it. A cell phone. Exactly right, their cell phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I knew they wouldn't remember, so I made up these little hidey holes, these little hutches, so I could catch the people like you. All right, cool, dude. Uh, I'm gonna get some breakfast since I've got time. I'll see you in 57 minutes. No, 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 no. You don't get to leave. Come with me. Corner of shame for you. What? Oh, come on. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's 10:45, but there's a bunch of people here. It looks like 11 o'clock, so I don't know what's going on. No. <laughs> You fool! Do you even know what? Wait, are you the same guy? Uh, no, my watch band is different. Oh, no. Never mind then. Anyway, you fool! Do you even know what day it is? Uh, no, not really. I just got up, and my wife told me to be here. It's the twenty-first. That means it's the outrageous series. It starts at nine fifty-seven. Oh, you're here at ten forty-five. You're an hour late. What are you doing? Okay, well, in that case, I've already missed most of the service, so uh. Deuce as well, I'll see you later. No, you can't leave now. No, 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 wait, don't, don't, don't leave. Don't, don't leave. What? Got the corner of shame. All right, let's go. Ba -da -ba -ba -da -ba. Ask y'all if you will, let's stand together and sing, and no one today will go into the corner of shame. Amen? All right, here we go.
something we may not yet see. So with the faith you've given us, we'll step into the valley unafraid. Yeah. Yeah. As we call out to dry bones, come alive, come alive. We call out to dead hearts, come alive, come alive. Up out of the ashes, 
be seated. As we're getting ready for a little prayer time, I want to remind everybody about this little slip of paper that's in your bulletin. Everybody can fill out the top part. The bottom part lets us know how we can pray for you. And if you'll fill that out, drop it in the offering basket. As it comes by in a few moments, we'll be praying for you as we meet together um, as a staff tomorrow, and we'll be lifting you up. We have some uh, uh, updates and some folks we need to add to our prayer list. We want to rejoice. Our mission team made it back this morning. They didn't get back until 8.30 this morning to uh, the Pensacola airport. They were supposed to fly into New Orleans. Uh, Some dude named Barry had something to do with that. Uh, But uh, we, we are glad they finally made it home and they're back home safe. We're also thankful for Ann and her team and the kids that came back from camp. They're home safe. Uh, and uh, Ann's back over with the kids and you know, taking up that lead today. So uh, two pra- praise reports. I uh, want to um, invite you to pray for Frank uh, Friedman. Uh, he was placed in the hospital last night uh, with pneumonia and with congestive heart failure. So be in prayer for Frank. Uh, he's probably witnessing to the nurses and, and telling the doctors about Jesus. That's what he does a lot when he gets in there. So uh, uh, And... So be in prayer for him as he is recovering. Be in prayer for Dot as she's taking care of him. Uh, So we want to invite you to lift them up. Uh, On Wednesday, I got a phone call uh, from my grandson. And uh, I don't normally just talk about the phone calls I get from them. But I answered, and before I could say another word, he said, Pappy, I'm a Christian now. Uh, So at Vacation Bible School, he accepted Christ. And so he could not wait. So, yeah. So, uh, uh, his mom said the next morning he got up and he said, finally, I'm in the family of God. So, I mean, he's eight and a half. So, you know, uh, he hadn't been waiting that long, but it was exciting to get that phone call. And, uh, I just wanted to share that with, uh, my church family. And, uh, I knew you'd like to hear those great things. Uh, I want to introduce you to someone. Uh, my brother Gene is here, Gene Presley. He's, he's my brother. You've been praying for him and lifting him up. Uh, he had, uh, he lost his wife recently and, uh, he wanted to ask permission to say a word to you guys. So I want to invite Gene up and can I borrow your microphone? I don't think he wants to lean that close into my <laughs> mic. So uh, yeah, there you go. All right. I've been informed I need to stand, you know, like this, so we'll give it a try. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to start out first by saying that it's truly inspiring to see so many people do something for someone that most, uh, if not all of you, had never met. I wanted to personally stop by 
this congregation and, and let everyone know that myself and my family greatly appreciated the prayers, the condolences, and the help that we received from this congregation. Although most of you have never met my son or my in-laws, they were very impressed and very touched with what you, the ladies and gentlemen of this congregation, did for us. So from all of us, thank you. To my brother and his family, they'll be here later, I understand. The, uh, they say you never repay anything to family, as that's what the term means. Family stands together no matter what, and if they are needed, they are there. Well, for me, that became a reality that I had not anticipated having to have so early in my life. I know I can never repay you for what you've done, nor would Anita even allow me to try. But I just wanted to say thank you, and I love you all. Okay. Love you, brother. And I'm the better looking brother, just to make sure y'all get that. Uh, that's, that's my story and I'm sticking with it. Uh, if you'd like to join me for a time of prayer around the altar, you're welcome to join me. Uh, you can come and stand and kneel here. You're welcome to pray where you are, but will you join me for prayer? Well, Lord, we're so thankful. We're thankful for the love and mercy and grace that you extend to us every day. We're thankful, Father, that no matter what we walk through in life, you are never far from us. You're always right there with us. You never leave us alone. So we're thankful for that, Father. We're thankful for the help that you give to us when we're hurting. We're thankful that when we're sick, we know that you are our physician and you walk with us. You may use doctors and nurses and procedures and, and medication, but you are the ultimate healer. And so we give you thanks for that. We thank you during the hard times when we feel alone that we're not alone because you've promised to be with us. So, Father, we give thanks today. We pray for all those on this prayer list. We give you praise for the good news. We give you uh, thanks for all that we have celebrated and for all the folks who are going through things and who are hurting. We give you thanks for hope that you'll be with them and you'll walk with them through this. So we give you that thanks today. Lord, you're never stingy with us. And we are so thankful that you give us the opportunity to give back to you through the giving of your tithes and our offerings. So we pray that you would take these tithes and offerings, use them for your glory, for the building of your kingdom, and for the winning of the lost to Christ. And we'll remember to give you praise. In your name I pray. Amen. So as you give to the church, you support the ministries that, go, that continue to go on year-round. So we want to thank you as you give for your generosity. Uh, this time we want to invite our ushers to come forward and let's continue with our service.
There's no wall you won't kick down and lie you won't tear down coming after me. There's no shadow. something a little different today just to let you know if you uh, give you a chance to look up the scriptures first kings 18 in the old testament um and if you want to look that up it's the scripture's not going to be on the screen today so it, it is in your notes though that are in your bulletin so if you want to follow along there or if you want to look it up you'll be able to follow along we're going to look at several verses from that passage uh so uh just the scripture didn't make it today the points did but the scripture didn't make it into the notes uh next week uh it is going to be kind of outrageous we're going to do something that you're not expecting next week um and so uh, what time did he say we're supposed to be here all right, 9.57, so I just want to make sure we get that out there, uh, and uh, we've been talking about it for about two months now, so, uh, but uh, uh, that means I get to sleep a little later on Sunday morning, too, so that'll be great, uh, but we you know, invite folks to come for that four-week series about Outrageous. Next Sunday, we're kicking it off. Um, Y'all know that I went to Israel, uh, many of you do know that I went to Israel back in February. I was blessed with that trip, that I had the opportunity to go and enjoy that time there. And on our first full day in Israel, we went to several sites. But the site that just struck me the most was a, a mountain. It was more like a hill, but they call it a mount there. And, uh, and while we were there, we were looking at this place called Mount Carmel. And uh, as... As we were overlooking this valley, Mount Carmel sits in the Kishon Valley in the plain of Megiddo. And Ezra, our guide, he told us to look around. From our mountaintop experience, we were able to look around all this big valley down there. And some of you may have, if you may have read in the Bible the Battle of Armageddon, uh, the final battle to end all of history. Uh, the, our guide, Ezra, said that that battle is going to take place in that valley. 
And I'm standing there thinking, you know, wow. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here at this place on top of this mountain looking down in this valley where the battle to end all of time is going to take place. And another battle had taken place, though, uh, several thousand years ago. And this was the battle between a guy by the name of Elijah. He came on to take on the prophets of Baal, the prophets from a false, they're following this idol. And uh, he came to this particular mountain to take on that, this battle. And what I found very interesting is that as I was sitting there, the, you know, the, our guide did something that I didn't know he was going to do. He said, would anybody like to read the scripture about this? And I was quick to volunteer because I've always liked this story. And I volunteered. And here on the mountain where this took place, I was able to read the scripture we're going to be looking at about the battle between Elijah and the prophets of Baal. So to me, that was a very powerful, personally, uh, to be able to take part in that. So today, I want us to look at that battle. Today, I want us to go back to Mount Carmel. Ahab was the king of Israel at that time. And as he being the king of Israel, to tell you what kind of man he was... We can read what the author of 1 Kings says about him. Now, I want you to notice this. It says, in 1 Kings 16, verse 30, it says, Ahab, son of Omri, listen to this, did more evil in the eyes of the Lord than any of those before him. If you're going to have a reputation, that's not the one to have. No other king had been as evil as he was. And then Ahab, he married an evil woman by the name of Jezebel. And Jezebel's father was a priest in Tyre. And her father eventually became the king of Tyre. Uh, and uh, Jezebel worshipped this god of, called Baal, and in order to please her, Ahab built a temple for worship to Baal. So we pick the story back up in verses 32 and 33. It says, he, talking about Ahab, set up an altar for Baal in the temple of Baal that he built in Samaria. <laughs> Listen to this next uh, verse. Ahab also made an Asherah pole and did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than did all the kings of Israel before him. Already found out he was evil, but he did more to, to make God mad, to provoke God's anger, than all of the other kings before him. Nobody has ever been this evil at this point. And that leads us to the problem. You see, listen, don't miss this. Ahab was the earthly king of God's chosen people. He was the earthly king of Israel. And he was leading the entire nation of Israel away from worshiping God to an idol worship by establishing these temples of Baal and temples of, to Asherah for people to come and worship. He, the leader of the nation of the people of God was leading people away from God. Baal and Asherah were the most popular gods of the Canaanites. And uh, worship of them centered around a lust for power and for sexual pleasure. And in an effort to bring the people of Israel back to worshiping the one true God, God sent this prophet by the name of Elijah. He was sent as this prophet to tell them about the error of their ways. And he did it, and he didn't pull any punches. He even called out the king and Jezebel. So Elijah and the priests of Baal, they were often battling it out to prove which God was the real God. And I'm not going to go into all the other battles they went into. I want to go into just this one. So let's pick up the story again in in 1 Kings 18. It says, when he, Ahab, saw Elijah, 
He said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? <laughs> you can tell if, he, if the king knew Elijah by name, Elijah had been stirring stuff up. You troubler of Israel. I have not made trouble for Israel, Elijah replied, but you and your father's family have. He's calling out the most powerful guy in the nation. You have abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel to meet me on Mount Carmel. Elijah says, I'm calling them out. I'm calling you out. Meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, now, you need to hear this verse. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, follow him. Pick a team. You can't have it both ways, Elijah said. You got to pick whichever God you're going to follow, and you got to stand for it. Is it the real God, or are you going to follow the prophets of Baal and, and worship Baal? You pick it, and then whenever you challenge them with that statement, it says, but the people said nothing. See, why, why were they wavering between these two choices? I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. I don't know why they were wavering. Maybe, maybe some were not sure as to which God was the real God. Maybe some just couldn't figure it out. However, there were many there that knew that God was the one true God, but they enjoyed the sinful pleasures and other benefits that came with following Ahab and the Baals that he worshipped. So they realized that if you want to make it in this town, you better keep up with the king. So the question posed by Elijah is the same question we need to answer today. How long are you going to waver between two opinions? How long are you going to waver between who God really is? How long are you going to make the, uh, or waver about making the choice about which God to follow? See, if... if it is important for people to stand and trust in the Lord. If we just drift along with whatever is pleasant and with whatever is easy, we will one day discover that we've been worshiping a false God and that false God is ourselves. You see, the more times we reject God, the harder our hearts become. And, and the harder our hearts become, the more deaf we become to hearing God's call for us to come to Him. And now listen, God will never stop calling us, but we can get to the point where we're not listening. I want to say that again. God will never stop calling out to us, but we will get to the point where we no longer listen to the call that he's put out for us. Elijah told the people that they had to choose, that you can't, you, you can't go the direction you're going, Elijah said. You can no longer try to, you know, straddle the fence. You can no longer try to, to, to just get along to get along, you know, go along to get along. He said, you've got to make a choice. And so he, when he told them that, that they had to make a choice, he said, I've got a challenge for you. Listen to this challenge. Then Elijah said to them, I am the only one of the Lord's prophets left. There's nobody else. But Baal has 450 prophets. Now get two bulls for us, Elijah says. Let Baal's prophets choose one for themselves. In other words, Elijah said, you go first. 
And let them cut into piece, cut it into pieces, the, this, this uh, bull, and, and put it on the wood, but set no fire to it. I will prepare the other bull and put it on the wood, but not set fire to it. Then you call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Now, before these folks had not said anything, now they say this. Now, then all the people said, what you say is good. I mean, let's think about it. If you were there, and if you were looking at this challenge on paper, one prophet of God versus 450 prophets of Baal with another 400 prophets of Asherah sitting on the bench ready to run in. Now, if you were looking at that, you'd think, Elijah hadn't got a chance. Just looking at it on paper, you'd think Elijah would not have a chance. He gave them first choice of the bull. And the prophets of Baal, they they prepared this altar and got it ready. They put the wood on it. They took the, the bull and they laid it on there. And then they started praying out to Baal, asking him to send fire down to consume the, alt, the, the, the offering that was there. And then they started praying harder and nothing happened. And then they danced around the altar begging Baal to answer their questions. Nothing happened. They yelled and they danced until noon. Nothing happened. They cut themselves in their dance with their swords and nothing happened. And then Elijah tried to encourage them a little. Around noontime, Elijah began to taunt them. Notice what Elijah said. Shout louder. He said, surely he is the God. Perhaps he is deep in thought. Or busy. Or traveling. Maybe he is asleep and must be awakened. The prophets of Baal must have thought, maybe he's right. So they shouted louder. If you go in the living Bible, it says, you know, perhaps he's on the toilet, Baal is, you know, and he's not listening to you. I mean, it's just amazing this kind of stuff, you know, that, that, that he was not listening at all. And, and he goes on and, and they shout louder and they dance more and they cut themselves with lances. Nothing happened. They were dancing, shouting, and bleeding all over the place, and nothing happened. And then notice what it says. And midday passed, and they continued their frantic prophesying until the time for the evening sacrifice. But there was no response. No one answered. No one paid attention. They did this all day long. Listen. You know why nothing happened when they were praying to Baal? It's very simple. False gods cannot make real promises. Back in 1982, seven residents of the greater Chicago area made an assumption that proved fatal. These seven residents of Chicago, they all took a dose of extra strength Tylenol that had been laced with potassium cyanide. And what they thought was medicine proved to be poison. Imagine the horror of taking what you thought was beneficial and discovering too late that it's killing you. I mean, that's the danger we face when we replace the one true God with all of these false gods out there. You know, often whenever we mention idols and false gods, people have things that automatically pop up in their mind. Some of them think about that little Buddha statue, you know, a little fat guy sitting there, you know, that is everywhere. Some folks think of Islam. 
when they talk about false gods. Some folks think of Confucius. Some folks think of satanic worship. Some folks think of, of some kind of statue that people pray to. Some folks think of voodoo. Some folks think about the cow in India. I mean, you know, I have a friend of mine, Joyce Sanford. She went to India on a mission trip. And as she was, got to India and she was getting, uh, they were leaving, the mission team was leaving from the airport to go to their first des destination. They had this great big sign there, she said. And on that sign, it says, Welcome to India, the land of a thousand gods. See, sometimes when, whenever we think of, of these uh, idols, we think of that kind of thing. But it is true that these are false gods, but they're not the only ones. We've got false gods all around us. There are false gods. These false gods are always making promises they can't keep. Let me share a few of those with you. Money is a false god for some folks. You see, people believe that if they can just get enough money, then they're going to be able to find contentment and happiness. I want somebody to please define for me what enough money is. I have not found anybody who can give me that definition. I've not found anybody. I've not read about anybody saying, well, I'm rich enough. I don't need any more money. And everybody thinks that if we could just get to the next level, if we can get you know, that salary increase or get this paid off or get that taken care of, then we'd be set and we'd be okay. Well, money is a false god. It cannot buy you happiness. Some folks hang their false god sign on success. Listen, people believe that if they can just be successful enough, then they would be able to find the rest and peace that they are looking for. Define enough success. Listen, I was thinking about this message this past week as I was getting ready to come in here. If you have sacrificed your family in order to be successful, you have failed. Now, there's nothing wrong with success. There's nothing wrong with, with having success. But if you have gone to the point where you've sacrificed your family to the point that, 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 uh, that success is more important to you than your family, then you are not a success because, listen, at the end of your time, whenever you're laying on your deathbed, you're not going to be saying, I wish I'd have made one more deal. I wish I'd have made one more dollar. I wish I'd have closed one more thing. I wish I'd have achieved one more account. Listen, as you're laying on your deathbed, what that you will not be thinking about any of that stuff. If you have put that much on success, it's not too late to reevaluate where you are. Relationships. People believe that if they can just find the right person to share their lives with, then they're going to experience true joy. Or they think that if they can just fix their spouse or girlfriend or boyfriend, and then they're going to find true joy. If they can just do that. Listen, and if they don't have the right person now, then they can just exchange them for somebody else and they'll keep doing that until they find Mr. or Miss Right. Listen, let me give you a little clue. The only problem is that when you change relationships, you carry part of the problem with you into the next relationship because you're part of the problem. I've sat down with couples, and I can tell you which ones are going to be able to fix their marriage and which ones aren't. When I sat down with a, I'm not limiting God's ability. God can, I've seen God redeem families in a whole bunch of ways. I mean, it's, it's just been remarkable. But listen, when I sit down with a couple and talk to them, if one of them is wanting me to fix the other one, they're not going to listen to anything I have to say. Because they're wanting the other person to get fixed. And if you're wanting your spouse to get fixed, that means you think you are perfect. Hello, you're not. Amen. If that offended you, you're just going to have to deal with it. I mean, in case you hadn't figured it out, you're part of the problem if there's a problem. 
You didn't marry yourself. I know there's some lady in Atlanta that did that. I don't know how she did that. How do you divorce yourself? I don't get that. But you know, you know, but you don't marry yourself. One another fault, Scott, out there are addictions. Ask any addict about the lies that addictions tell them. Some folks, their God is sex. Some folks, their God is government or politics. I had a guy one time, I just mentioned the name of the president. Just, this is years ago. Many years ago. I just mentioned his name. His face got blood red. Anger all over him. And, you know, he wasn't just angry. He was mad. Foaming out the mouth mad. I'm thinking, okay, well, we can't talk about this anymore. I'm cool with it, but he's going to have a heart attack. You know, uh, you know, you know, but for some people, they put, they put that, that politics ahead of anything. Listen, it's not in government we trust. It's in God we trust. I'm going to meddle a little bit. Some people... Their pet is their God. I was listening to an ad the other day. I wish I could have rewound it and listened to it again, but I've heard it multiple times, so I heard exactly what was said. I didn't think I heard it the first time, but after hearing it multiple times, and if you listen to uh, XM Radio, Channel 114, you'll hear this ad uh, rolling through there throughout the day. Did you know if you're having trouble picking out a puppy, there is a company that will give you a puppy concierge. <laughs> if you can't pick out a dog, you don't need no help. But there are people, that, that puppy, they're, they're, that, 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 that whatever it is, puppy, cat, whatever it is, you pick the pet, it becomes their God. I mean, you got to make sure to take care of Fluffy. You know, Roscoe can't take care of himself. Dogs were taking care of themselves before you came along. Okay, I'll quit meddling. All right, well, maybe not. Uh, because there's another God out there, and it's yourself. Any time that you put yourself above God, you're putting yourself as God. Any time you say no to God, you're putting yourself as God, saying, I know better than you do, God. The list is endless. Because anything that you place above God in your life is your own idol. I love this quote, and I don't know where the source is. Uh, when I read it, they didn't source it out either. But it says, an idol can never be the first because an idol needs someone to make it. And an idol can never be last because they wear out and break. A God that you create is worthless. None of the false gods I mentioned above are going to last. Any kind of peace or joy or contentment or hope you think these false gods are going to bring you is not real. When you trust in a false god, you're taking extra strength Tylenol laced with potassium cyanide. It will not help your pain. It will destroy you. The reason it will destroy you is because only the real God can answer your prayers. Finally, after they had danced around, they'd cut themselves, they'd yelled and screamed and shouted, and Elijah encouraged them to shout louder. They'd done this all day long. And I can almost picture Elijah looking over at them saying, You done? You, you finished? I mean, you had all day. It's time, of, time for the evening sacrifice. You know, you, you, are you done? Elijah called all the people to come up to him and 
the altar that was supposed to be used to worship God had been torn down. And he, he rebuilt the altar out of 12 stones. Each stone represented a tribe of Israel. And then he had a trench dug around the altar. And he laid wood on the altar. He placed the sacrifice on top of the altar. And as he looked and he observed it, Elijah said, uh, Fill four jugs of water and bring it over here and dump it on here. And after they would poured four jugs of water on top of the altar, Elijah looked and said, bring me four more. And they dumped those four on there. And Elijah said, let's do it one more time. And they brought in four more. Twelve of these big jugs of water. It was so much water, it covered the entire offering, the entire sacrifice. The animal, the, the, the uh, wood, the stones, and the trench that was all the way around it filled up with water. See, Elijah was making sure that, that this sacrifice could not be accidentally burnt up. He was setting the stage to get ready for something to happen. Can you imagine what these people were thinking? Can you imagine the prophets of Baal? I mean, they're standing there. They're bleeding. They're tired. They're hoarse from shouting louder. They have done all of this kind of stuff. And, and, and then th these prophets of Baal could not get their God to burn a dry sacrifice. So imagine as they're watching Elijah have water dumped on this. And, 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 and you know, they're, can you imagine what was going through their head? Now is the time for the evening sacrifice. Elijah didn't shout. Elijah didn't cut himself. Elijah didn't dance. He didn't do any of that kind of stuff. He simply prayed. And here's his prayer. The author of 1 Kings records it. It says, at the time of the sacrifice, the prophet Elijah stepped forward and prayed, O Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known today that you are God in Israel. And that I am your servant and have done all these things at your command. Answer me, Lord, answer me. So these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God. And that you are turning their hearts back again. That's it. Elijah's prayer was real bold. He not only asked for fire to consume the altar, he prayed for the conversion of an entire nation. See, we get so tied up thinking we have to fix ourselves or do something special in order to get God's attention when all we have to do is pray. Listen, God is right there with you wherever you are. He is right there with you. He, and besides, you know, God is listening to you. He's beside you. He's listening to you. And He wants to hear from you. All you have to do is pray and He will hear you. God heard Elijah. Notice what happened. Little boy wanted $100 badly. We're going to talk about him in a minute. But for Elijah, Elijah, see, the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, the wood and the stones and the soil, and also licked up the water in the trench. Imagine being there watching all of that happen. Suddenly, it happened. Elijah simply prayed and then this fire came down. How hot does a fire have to be to burn up rocks? It consumed the entire thing. Back to that little boy. Little boy wanted $100 real bad. And he prayed to God for a whole week, but nothing happened. So he decided to write God a letter requesting $100. And so the little boy wrote the letter, and when the post office got the letter addressed to God, they just forwarded it to the White House. And the president was very impressed and touched and amused to so much so that he instructed his aide to send $5 to the boy. 
After all, he thought $5 would be a lot to a little boy, so he sent the $5 there, and the boy, indeed, was he was so delighted to get the money, he sat down and he wrote a thank you note, and this is what it said. It says, Dear God, thank you very much for sending the money. However, I noticed that for some reason you had to send it through Washington, and as usual, they kept most of it. what a false God is going to do. It's going to take from you. It's not going to give to you. And see, the thing about God, God does not go halfway with you. God does not restrict his blessings to you. You might not understand what God's doing in your life. You might not get it. It might not make sense. You may have more questions than anything else. But trust me, if he can create the entire universe, he can take care of you. God does not do anything halfway. God gives us what we need when we need it. God doesn't hold anything back. You see, God will give us wisdom to raise a family. God will give us courage to stand on the truth. God will give us the means to provide for someone else in need. God will give us direction in our lives, but he will only do that If we let him. See, just like Elijah, we need to trust him. When all the people saw this, the author writes, when they saw that this fire had come down from heaven and had consumed the the sacrifice, had consumed the wood, had consumed the stones, had dried up all of the water that was around there. There was nothing left of anything that, that, that Elijah had put there. When they saw that, they, they fell down and they said this, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Did you notice how the people, people responded? They said, The Lord, He is God. They did not say, The Lord, He is our God. See, they finally acknowledged that God, the the one true God, that he was God. But they did not say that he was their God. They acknowledged who this real God was, and now they, they didn't acknowledge that he was now their God. So God showed his power to Israel yet again, and they continued to turn away from him. Listen, God is showing you in your life that he loves you. And how has he done that? He's given you several, several different ways so that you could understand it. See, some people, some people could see a miraculous sign happen right in front of them and they may acknowledge that God is God and they, but they still will not accept him as their God. You see, God doesn't need to prove himself to us. God does not need to show his power to us. God does not need to prove that he is God because he's already done that. He he sent Jesus to die for us and he raised Jesus back from from, uh, death to life. He's shown us his power. Listen, that's not just a theological statement. That's a historical statement based in fact. I could give you a whole laundry list of reasons to believe in the resurrection, you know, with all the witnesses that were there. And all, you know, we could go through all that, and I'd be glad to do that if you want to spend a little time talking about it. But I'm just here to tell you that that statement I just made is not just a theological fact that Jesus was raised from the dead. That's a historical fact. Even non-believers will, be, will believe that he was raised from the dead. See, people who witness, listen, people who witnessed the resurrected Jesus chose to die declaring it to be true rather than deny it and live. You ever known of anybody to knowingly die for a lie? They chose to say, I'm going to trust. I saw him. I touched him. I had a fish fry with him on the beach. 
Go back and read in the New Testament. It's there. Maybe not a fry, but a fish grilling on the beach. I mean, you can go, you can, you can go back and see it. Listen. I remember being on that mount, on Mount Carmel in Israel, and as I stood on the mount where this spiritual battle took place, there on that mount, centuries ago, people stood at the most important crossroads of their life. They saw his power, and they saw his glory, and they still said no to him. They saw God's power and glory. He had just... How many of you have seen fire fall from heaven and consume a wet altar? They'd just seen all of that happen. And this fire came down and consumed everything. Right after he had prayed and they had seen all of that. And here Elijah was on this mount. He's challenging them to make a choice. And I'm challenging you to make a choice. Listen, how long, the same thing that Elijah said to them, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal is God, then follow him. Pick your God. See, right there on that mount, a lot of people chose to say no to the one true God even after they witnessed his answer by fire. They say his power. They, they saw his power and his glory. So my question for you is what about you? God has already demonstrated his grace for you today. He's given you another day to live. God has already shown you his mercy by offering to forgive you of your sins no matter what they are. God has already shown you his power through the resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. God has already shown you his love and his patience by constantly pursuing you, even after you have rejected him time and time and time again. So I want to ask you, what choice are you going to make today? Are you going to acknowledge that he is God? And that he is your God? You see, the choice is yours. I encourage you to choose wisely. Will you pray with me? Oh, Lord. We read the story and heard the message from your book and your word. We've seen how Elijah stood up for you when no one else would. How he was the only prophet. And he stood for you. In the face of overwhelming odds, he stood for you. In the face of ridicule and in the face of a powerful king wanting to silence him, he stood for you. None of us have faced that kind of stuff. And God, I pray that we would stand for you today, that we'd stand for you wherever we are. Maybe there are some of you who have run away from God and, and you, you know, that, that, that call of God to you is, feels like it's getting further and further away or getting so, more silent and you can't hear it. Because you've rejected God so much up to this point. Well, let today be the day you stop rejecting him. Let today be the day you come into his family. You want to do that and would like to begin a relationship with uh, Jesus Christ today and make God your God. I want to invite you to pray this very simple prayer just between you and God. You can remember it with these four words. If you'll just pray this prayer in your own words after me to God and invite Jesus into your heart. The first word is sorry. God, I'm sorry for what I've done wrong. I'm sorry for the sin in my life. I'm sorry I've rejected you up to this point in my life. The next word is please. Please forgive me of my sins. Please come into my life and save me. Please become the Lord of my life. And the last two words are thank you. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for forgiving me. Thank you for not giving up on me. Thank you for giving me your son as my savior. Father, for those who have prayed that prayer for the first time today in a minute, I pray that you would be with them, that you would strengthen them, that you would help them as they are, 
uh, beginning this new walk with you. For others here who are already Christ followers, they may be struggling with something in their life. They may be struggling with their faith. They, they may have accepted you, but they still keep putting other things in front of you. Help those of us who are doing that to get our priorities in order. Put you first, and then everything else falls in place. Help us, Lord, because we need you. In your name, amen. If you'd like to spend some time in prayer around the altar, you're welcome to do that. We open it up each and every Sunday. Uh, I'm going to be down here. I'm going to spend a little time in prayer myself. If you want me to pray with you, I'll be glad to do that. Simply get my attention. If you don't get my attention, I won't bother you. But I'll be glad to pray with you if you need me to. I want to invite you as we stand to sing this next song. This altar is open for you to come.
I want to remind you again about next week, 957. Uh, I look forward to seeing you here. It's going to be really, really different. Uh, as, you know, just come and see what happens next week. Uh, but if this is your first time here or if you've been here before and I haven't had a chance to meet you, I would love to visit with you. I'm going to be in the library. As you exit these doors, hang a left. Come down here and see me. I'd love to get to know you a little bit. Uh, thank you so much for being here. And to close us out, I want to turn it to Miss Brenda. She's got a word for you. And uh, she also has uh, our closing prayer. Brenda. Great. Good to see you here today. Remember, school supplies. We're helping Central. And the last time we did this, all their seats.